Dialogue is action. Mm -hmm. That dialogue itself can be an assault, can be war, can Mm -hmm. be lovemaking, can be whatever it is that actually it's in the words themselves in well-written dialogue. And that that's what makes dialogue not necessarily just a conversation. Hi and welcome to Storia, where storytellers disrupt. I'm Fabiano Altamora. And I'm David Noronha. And listen, remember to like, subscribe, and leave us a five-star review. Today, we are going to be talking about what, brother? You tell me. You're going to be interviewing me on something, right? I am, yeah. We're going to do a back and forth. This is going to actually be a two-parter. Um, Fab and I, um, we started as actors, but I think we both have a love and appreciation for working with actors as directors. Mm-hmm. And so today... I wanted to actually take a deep dive with you and then we're going to flip in the part two where you'll ask me kind of, and we'll explore the same question, which is this, as a director, Mm -hmm. first of all, I want to hear your view on what a director is. And then I want to dive into how you approach directing a piece. So what's your definition of, of a director, man? What's a director do? For me, a director is God, right? Yeah. On a movie or a piece of theater. Yeah. The director... Okay, God, let's say an apostle, right? He gets the vision. He takes the story and all its components, dissects it, and starts to bring all the pieces together to orchestrate Mm -hmm. this beautiful story with all its moving pieces intricately so it communicates the story of the playwright to the audience. Yeah, so it's God... Not as authoritarian no, no, or no, no, dictator, no. but as designer. As designer. And, yeah, like a fashion designer. Yeah, you one architect. Of your other loves. Exactly, one of my other loves. It's You architect this beautiful piece. There are so many moving pieces to it. Because people think a director is just on the creative side. It isn't. It's on the budgetary side. It's on the scheduling side. It's on so many different aspects of the piece that aren't just creative. It's logistical. It's administrative. Um, and the director pulls all those pieces together whilst creating an amazing creative culture mm. to foster a creative, you know, to foster creativity within the cast yeah, and crew. You're also setting the culture for the cast, whether on set or whether in the theater, right? Yeah. I mean, set and crew, right? Because you're actually coming in as a director. You're not only just... I mean, with our budgets, let's be honest, we're doing set design, we're doing costume design. It's not like we have, you know, wardrobe. We, we, we get it. hit budget on two sides. We're, yeah. we're in a church and yeah. we're educational. <laughs> and so, but that's beautiful because it kind of so? forces in this, it forces creativity. I think when you've got limitless budgets, I mean, I, not that I've ever worked that way, but I mean, I've been on a movie with somewhat hundreds of millions of dollars. But I would say that when you are forced into a pressure cooker, mm. you're forced to find creative solutions to make it work. I mean, look at Little Women that you directed at Christmas, right? You know, so it forces us to be very creative and come out with solutions that we're like, Lord, if you don't turn up mm. or give me a solution, I don't know what I'm going to do for five grand. I think that's just um, a good philosophy or principle in general. I mean, what we do know is that money does not guarantee success. It doesn't guarantee (laughs) happiness. I mean, if I just take a look at a lot of the major Hollywood films that in some sense have maybe not unlimited, but they certainly have a ton of cash and it doesn't always guarantee a good story. I want to roll back with you a little bit and Mm -hmm. ask you, what was your first experience as a director? What was the first piece that you directed? The first piece that I directed, my goodness, that's a great, great question. I I mean, what did you direct back in? Yeah, I directed back in the UK and it was more um, kind of children's theater back because in the you, UK. Because you and your wife, Claire, who's also yeah. another uh, one of the co-founders of Bethel Conservatory of the Arts, I, I often forget this, but you guys actually ha- started your own school. We had our own Christian school back in the UK. That is correct. And I would direct mm. kids from, say, four to eight years old wow. in pieces. And you know, it was beautiful. Like, in its purest form, it was difficult, but... I, t- to an extent, again, educational, Yeah, y- you kind of cut your teeth as a director when you're directing four to eight year olds. 
Well, you do, right? Because I mean, what are you going to do? They're jumping off the wall. They're like, oh my goodness, it's hard work. It's actually not very, very different with college Have kids. you ever directed kids before and animals by any chance? You and I have broken the, <laughs> like the two cardinal rules. Yep. And, and not only did I direct children and animals, <laughs> I directed the biggest scene on the first day, which is maybe the other silent third carnal, which is you should start with the earliest scene. Why don't we just start a scene with every character in the film from the top with every, every, every Oh, in bright ones? <laughs> which I reach watched the other day. But all right. But Dude, that's gonna, a, just a side note. That's a great freaking movie. I'll share with you this experience that I had with it just recently watching it with my daughter, which was, which was quite, quite profound. So, all right. So you, you start this Christian school yeah. and probably out of both love and necessity. Necessity. Yeah. I don't know about love. <laughs> necessity. <laughs> you're directing children. I got to ask, yeah. what did you discover? What did directing, uh, you know, four to eight year olds teach you about directing? Uh, I mean... That's a, that's a great question. I mean, the, the, yeah. <laughs> what did it teach me about directing? To be resourceful, yeah, right? To figure out systems whereby they can thrive and it still be a discipline. Yeah. And we still have to put a show on in a certain amount of time. And obviously these aren't big budget shows, um, but it showed me how to economize not just financially economize with what scripts I would choose yeah. so that I could actually cast within the framework. You have to be of super intentional when you're directing with very little money and, and with kids. Very intentional. All right. So your first experiences were with, with kids at the Christian school. Fast forward, what was the next key directing experience or moment? I think the biggest thing that then I would direct in the United States was with you, was I3 at Bethel. Oh, wow. That was... Share a little bit about that. For those that didn't see I3, it was a production that we did yeah. through the School of Ministry, but lay out a little bit of the landscape of that piece. Yeah. So basically, I think, who, who you know, who really brought us into this environment, you know, Mama T, Teresa Dedman, beautiful creative, she, she brought us into this environment, in effect, really gave us a platform and in her and a fair amount of trust for not well i would say a ton of trust ton right of trust, yeah. she would have things like dance painting culinary, culinary arts, yeah. um fashion acting, fashion yeah. so we kind of got all these components of what she'd create in the bethel world of fashion right mm -hmm. and we changed the civic which is no small feat yeah the civic is uh the civic auditorium is in redding california i i describe it as like berlin post <laughs> <laughs> World War II, II concrete building, but it is a pretty cool structure and its yeah. seating capacity is in the thousands. Like 2200, I think it is. And um, we created into a new art, New York art, art gallery. And I think we created, I wouldn't say it was a variety show, yeah. but we created a show with mm, no massive narrative, mm -hmm. but had the components of fashion in it, had dance in it. It was like little scenes, wasn't it? That we kind of stitched together with these spoken word poetry right. and... Um, there was a theme. There, there was, was a theme. theme behind it. And I think that um, that was a, a huge thing for me because we wrote it, we directed it, we produced it. We had hardly any money as a budget. And I think we were doing it while we were in ministry school. With kids? With kids. And I was still running a business back home, mm -hmm. but I think it was beautiful in the sense that, right, having Pastor Bill on the front row, having Dan Farrelly on the front row, and I think what what hit me was that was the first time I actually, because I actually performed in it as well, you did. was the first time I performed in the presence of God at 37 years old on the civic stage. So I think what I loved about that was just, we could communicate, story obviously, as you know, always has to have an arc, yeah. but I like somewhat of the abstract. True that doesn't always like a Cirque du Soleil, doesn't always have to have necessarily a running full on storyline through it. And I think this had a theme, but it wasn't like a, no, a following storyline. No, no, it was you know a what I mean? very light. I mean, one of the key moments that I remember uh, of I3 was the opening number, which oh, was yeah. Spirit Come, I think was Spirit the song, Out. Spirit Break Out, that's right. Which was a, a, a big worship song mm -hmm. at that time. And I thought to myself, I mean, I've been in some really cool, I think we both have been in some yep. amazing performances and amazing productions and so on and so forth, but there was something different. And I think you touched on this phrase and not everybody might be familiar with this, this phrase that I think we use at Bethel and certainly BCA a lot, which is performing in a presence. Mm -hmm. So before we continue the, the story of you as a director, 
unpack for those that may not be familiar with this, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to us at BCA to perform in the presence of God? I think it's it's a really, it feels like a very abstract concept. Again, kind of, kind of like high spiritual concept, but for me, it isn't. For me to break it down in its simplest form, it's acknowledging that the Lord is in my heart at every mm. moment. So I use it with my students like this. I can't change the blocking. I can't change the script, mm. right? But what I may be able to change with him is an intention in the moment, mm. right? That I may, I may deliver something differently. And it's basically involving the Lord in my creative choices yeah. whilst I'm performing. And I think on a practical level, and I love that you're bringing it down to its earthly practical thing, because we mm -hmm. have real actors real kids. We call them kids no matter how old they are what because excellent. we just love them so much. Yeah. But these kids actually have to go out on this missionary field mm -hmm. on real sets, on real commercial sets, real Broadway sets, real film and, 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 and TV sets. And they, it's about staying connected with God, right? In a really basic way, it's about connecting with him before, during, and after, right? That this idea of performing in the present. Let me ask you a question. I know for you, there was a, a real special moment at the end of I3. Mm -hmm. What was that? You know, I, I started to weep at curtain call because I realized that, you know, as an actor and as a director, I, I don't know if I really knew who I was as a performer. And this is at 37, is by the way, I was 39 turning 30, 40, yeah, so I'm, exactly. I'm right there with you. Yeah. And I started to weep and it was, a Pastor Bill came on stage, gave me a, gave me a big hug. And I felt like I was being affirmed by the father and the father of the house. And it was like the Lord said this, the first time you've learned to perform from your identity, not for it. And the first time you've learned to perform in the presence and they're not taglines, they're life messages. Mm -hmm. And it, it was a big thing for me, you know, it nearly killed us doing it because we were running 12 interns and doing all those things. But nonetheless, the beauty that culminated in, in that moment changed my life. You know, we often talk about, um, and I've, I've shared it in other settings where I say, who will welcome mm -hmm. the creative prodigal sons and daughters home? And I wonder if in that moment, that's what you felt. Yeah, it, it was because like, you know, you and I came here, we didn't think we were going to pick up acting again. It was, it was laying it down in fear. And I think just being able to get to do it again with him in the environment that we love and to direct it was for me was just beautiful. Isn't it the irony beautiful. of God that, right? Like he asks you ridiculous. to lay it down only so he can allow you to bring it, take it back up, but in the context of a new identity. Yeah. Or we laid it down in fear or and we, he was, he, he never, honest. he never intended us to lay it down. Yeah. Maybe we just handed it to him for, for a stitch. I think we probably just was like, I, I've been so, I associate my craft with pain. So if I associate with anything with pain, I'm going to lay it down. It's like it being down. in a bad relationship. Of course or, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you that. know what I'm saying? So you have this profound mm -hmm. coming home, prodigal son, in the context of the school of ministry yep. and of, of your creativity, the, the Lord, in some sense, he, he resurrects, brushes off the pain and the dust of this thing. I think in some ways, man, and I, I don't know that it ever connected these two things. I don't know that it ever connected I3, this thing that we did with Teresa Dedman as the seed or the kernel yeah. for BCA. That in many oh, ways- it was, wasn't it? Right, we got to, the Lord allowed us the privilege of showcasing our affection for creativity in front of the fathers and the mothers of the house and the other kids in the house as well, that I think in many ways led towards us being able to have these conversations with Chris Valentin and and Bill and Danny Silk, where it's like, hey, we have this dream. I, I never mm -hmm. never thought that. Well, before. I think you build up trust, don't you? Like we, we, you know, we're directing pieces and then we end up directing multiple, multiple, multiple pieces for the church and, you know, for Bethel Music and for the Civic. And we, we, we end up building up are in effect showing that we, we, we are trusted, we're excellent at what we do. And, um, you know, I think that opened the door for us. You mentioned this, this word, this key of trust Yeah, that one production at a time, uh, one idea at a time, one creative venture at a time that maybe we built trust with the environment. What do you say to somebody I just want to go down this trail for a second. What do you say to somebody who's in a church or a school or an environment who has creative ambition and vision? What, what advice do you give them? Serve. Unpack that. What, 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 what do you mean to serve? Because sometimes, you know, we think that just because 
we may be a professional or we may have a desire to want to create that it's our right to be able mm. to go to a church. This idea of entitlement. Yeah, the entitlement. End day, and to, to put on a play. And I'm like, serve somebody's vision. Serve the vision of the pastor. Serve, like, you know, maybe do some plays in the church or do something. But I really think before you can build up any proof of, con well, before you can build, you have to show a proof of concept first. That's right. right. And you do it through serving. And you do it through serving. That's good, man. So we did I3. You had mm -hmm. your school stuff. Flash forward to the next big adventure as a director. Oh, then I did the School of Creativity in second year, mm -hmm. which I wrote produced, directed, and had the lead role in as well. And that was, again, a very similar concept, but on a different stage. It was yeah. in the sanctuary this time. And again, a mixture of spoken word and scenes and dance and rap and mm -hmm. fashion show and all that kind of stuff. You were functioning as a producer, just bringing right. whatever elements were, were available to you. Yeah, because I mean, I think my budget was like 120 bucks, you know, Ooh. to put on an entire conference. No, no, no three zeros after that. Not, not, no, not no, three, no. Three, not six, just no, 120. Just 120 bucks. But listen, again, you were resourceful. Mm -hmm. We did, we weren't paying for the venue. We did everything. But this time, I think I learned to do it in rest. I didn't know how to do I3 in rest. And as a director, I got a lot of fulfillment because, you know, I, I wrote it all as well with the time that I had. And I think it ended up being a relatively successful conference. I think I enjoyed, I had fun anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, that was the next big thing that I directed. I want to fast forward over to BCA. I know yeah. there were some other stops along the way. I know mm -hmm. that uh, you wrote and did you direct A Christmas Carol at the city? Yes. I mean, yeah. As well. A co-directed. Which was a yeah. huge venture for mm -hmm. our town to have um, this original production that mm -hmm. you had created based on um based on a Christmas Carol, but yeah. you had a twist on it yeah. and you were, you were in it, you mm -hmm. directed it, you wrote it, which was a huge, huge adventure. But fast forward over to BCA. What was the very next adventure as a director? Um, I think I, it was, uh, the passion play. It was, it was, um, Christus. Yeah. Miracle mystery play. That's right. And for yeah. those that may or may not be familiar with that, um, how, how would you describe it? What is, what is a, yeah, so the Miracle play. Mystery plays were written way, 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 way back in the day. And they used to be um, performed on carts. Yeah. So, you know, um, it, it was typically around the Stations of the Cross or the last week of last And when you say days. carts, we're talking like Pinocchio, where they would open the cart and in there, there would be- Yeah, the they would have the stages. Thing. They would be on, you know, on stages at different points and you would kind of promenade your way through these so different ancient. scenes- ancient you know probably i don't even know the dates maybe way back in the 1600 even way before the 1600s um and you know you i wouldn't say it was immersive somewhat but you would promenade through different scenes yeah and um i wanted to i think for me as a director i'd say if i had a signature thing as a director is what is the angle of the piece mm -hmm right? How can I make this different? Not for different sake, but what's the edge mm -hmm. that I would have? So the conceptual. Edge, yeah, yeah. The conceptual edge. So I was like, okay, we could do it in its original time, but what if we took it out and bought it dystopian? So in effect, you know, we would, we did it as if it was in the, the, the late two thousands and, um, whilst maintaining a bit of that yeah. historical feel. And you did it, you did it twice at BCA. Mm -hmm. And I do remember that, I think on both occasions, you used multiple locations, multiple rooms, almost like this card idea where people would travel to different scenes or yeah, moments. Yeah, so we'd promenade through maybe five or six different locations throughout, you know, outside in a couple of our buildings. And it was beautiful because the, you get, the, the audience get to walk mm. through the action yeah. and be immersed in the action and then it's almost like they're entering different pieces and locations exactly and, and each piece feels standalone yeah. so when jesus was getting whipped i had a big canvas at the yeah. back with jesus's face on it and jesus was turned towards the audience with like a a mask over his face like a burlap mask and as they whipped him there was this device where they would whip him and then throw blood on his face to show that he was being beaten. So I used kind of some very kind of maybe high art creative devices to show the torture scene. And, you know, to, it, it, it kind of makes it feel somewhat brutal, mm -hmm. 
Well, which, but, it, which it was. Which it was, yeah. but artistic at the same time. Um, we still have, I think, that canvas yeah. hanging in the hallway. In the oh. hallway, yeah. Because for me, it represents just one of our first pieces. And, you know, it was, it was, I personally felt it very moving to direct. And I think that the, the audience were definitely moved in it because I don't think we'd ever done, I don't think the city had ever seen anything like it. Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, you know what I mean? I do remember <laughs> I was still working at media at the time, uh, at Bethel media. And, um, I mean, I was, I was really excited, but you know about me that sometimes I, <laughs> I'm a little bit sound sensitive. Like I'm at, I'm the guy at Starbucks who says, Hey, can you turn down the music or whatever? Yeah. And, um, but I remember that we shot, uh, shot, look at me. That's my bias. That's my background. But we were outside. And I think in one of the Christuses, there was the whipping was actually happening. I think in the front parking lot of BCA. Yeah. And the thing is, I wanted the audience to be immersed in with the cast and because I wanted you to feel the uncomfort. Yeah. No, which I, I definitely did. I know you did. I remember <laughs> that. I want you to feel the uncomfort. And then we trans when we transitioned to the cruise, you know, Golgotha. Yep. That was like graffiti on the walls, hard, heavy metal as you walked in. You would in. have thrived in the Lower East Side off-Broadway theater scene in New York because that's where this experimental stuff was kind of happening. I remember that like there was- Punch drunk and stuff. Yeah. I remember that the 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 whipping scene uh, was happening outside mm -hmm. and I think somebody stopped and they were, you know, like somebody in the city because it was literally like, we have like an upholstery shop across the street. Yeah. And, and, and I remember that people thought something real was was happening. Yeah. Like, I think they were like, oh my gosh, is somebody getting hurt? Um, let me ask you something. At what is it that what is it that you would say is the thing that you go after whenever you go you touched on a version of it that you look for your angle but if you said if you were to describe your itch your superpower when it comes to story what is it that you tend to gravitate towards in story that you think you do well that you pull out of every story that you direct or tell i think for me it's the nuance of the language and the character yeah. i think you know you get some directors that will look at the spectacle of the piece, yeah. which, you know, can be beautiful. I think for me, it's finding the moment to moment between each actor mm -hmm. and find the actual juice mm -hmm. in each character that the intention that propels them forward. So for example, you know, the crucible definitely very, you know, I wouldn't say it's, it, there's a huge plot to it. Of course there is mm -hmm. very character driven, but like there are some scenes that don't feel like they jump off the page at all. So as a director, it's my duty to make the reality of that scene come to life. Between to the make two it, characters. Between yeah. the two characters. And a lot of the time it's sat down. So how do you make something that feels somewhat Static very, or, very static or yeah. very situational pop? Yeah. And for me, it's like, it's got to be in the language. You know, it's funny because Robert McKee, who's uh, one of the story gurus out there, he, he talks about how dialogue is action. Mm -hmm. that dialogue itself can be an assault, can be war, can mm -hmm. be lovemaking, can be whatever it is that actually right. it's in the words themselves in yeah. well-written dialogue. Yeah. And that that's what makes dialogue not necessarily just a conversation. Right. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause nobody, I mean, I joke, nobody wants to listen to your, your coffee at Starbucks with your best friend. No, no, no. And that's why you got to write. If you're going to look at Arthur Miller, you're going to think he's a genius playwright. Yeah. But if you're reading it face value, it's like, it's the director's job to make this jump off the page. Yeah. You know I think it's I mean? the difference too, between understanding the text and subtext, the mm -hmm. text being what's said and subtext being what's, yeah. what's underneath. Um, where do you want to go next as, as a director? What, what is it that I, I know you, you know, we've got a lot going on at yeah. BCA, but I also know that it brings you profound joy to be connected with the actors Creatively speaking, beyond being a teacher, beyond being an educator, is there any piece that you're aching to direct? Is there anything that when you look at the landscape of storytelling, you're like, I'd really love to, to even if you don't have it planned, what would you want to talk about next or tackle next as a director? I, there are two things for me. I think just from an artistic point of view, I would love to direct um, a Hamlet, mm. you know, or I would love to direct a Midsummer Night's Dream. I would love to to do that in a really, you know, like grungy place for Hamlet. Again, my bent always feels somewhat dystopian. I don't know yeah. why I love that era. What is it that you, because I, I would agree with you. I mean, I think you often go kind of future dystopian yeah. type distressed 
reality. It might just be what we're picking up in the culture. Mm. Why is it that you enjoy that that space, that space that might not be clean or earnest? I, I mean, clean in terms of like just grittiness. Um, why are you attracted to stories or to concepts in that space? You know, I mean, you know me, I, I love a cautionary tale. Yep. You know, I love the fact that dystopian somewhat is always a commentary on some cataclysmic event that mm -hmm. is now set the world back to reset, you know, the, the hierarchy of living in, in tremendous opulence and other people are struggling to try and make it work. And I think I like that juxtaposition of, you know, you, you, these feel like the, you know, the, the, the wealthy and, 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 and the kind of groundlings are trying to get back up to that or trying to kind of overcome some kind of evil. Hmm. It's like and a dystopian Rocky dy or something. Exactly. And there's just something about that, you know, the underdog rising to the top or, you know, something that I love about that, that just communicates overcoming resurrection you know, you've always got the resistance that are always trying to fight against, you know, the Alliance or whatever it is, you know, is it the Alliance or the, whatever it is in Star Wars, however they, they did the resistance against or whatever it is. I love it. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know what you're You know what I mean? So I think that, um, I, I like that maybe because I like the visual, mm -hmm. sometimes steampunk aspect mm -hmm. of that, the visual I like, I like the way the colors are. Um, but I just like that idea of trying to overcome something in, 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 in a, in a cautionary tale kind of way. If you were, t if you were talking to a young director, whether yourself or, you know, a future student at BCA or something like this, what advice would you give a young director? What, what tools or skills or advice or nudge or push would you give a young I mean, director? You know, you've got to find your voice as a director. You've got to find your, your, your style. I think like, don't be afraid to communicate what you want to communicate as a director. Don't be afraid to put your unique stamp on it. Your unique stamp is dystopian. I mean, don't do it all the time because it gets a bit boring. But if, if find out what 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 is your unique stamp as a director, I think. I don't know how that translates or what that sounds like practically. But it's like, don't be afraid to use what God has put in you, your passion. Mm to communicate that to the audience. And, you know, I, I don't think you always have to, and I, I particularly never do, play Shakespeare in its time. Mm. I always take it out. Like I'll do Richard III as Pablo Escobar, or I'll do something so that it, it, it becomes relevant mm -hmm. today. It's great, man. You know what I'm saying? Been good hanging with you, man. You too, dude. Thanks for hanging out with us at Storia. Please remember to like, give us that five-star review, download. See you next time.